I'd just like to welcome everybody to Google and uh, to this uh, opportunity to meet uh, uh, Deo uh, and hear about uh, what's going on in uh, Burundi. Uh, Deo is um, the, uh, the leader of an NGO called Village HealthWorks um, and uh, is doing really amazing, amazing work there. And so he'll be telling us a little bit about that today. Uh, they'll have, we'll have time for questions at the end. And uh, so without further ado, Deo. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really wonderful, wonderful to be here. I, I don't know, I was uh, chatting with one of you and asking what, how much did you, did you give God as a bribery to deserve this kind of environment. <laughs> it's so beautiful uh, and it's such an honor uh, for me and uh, my colleagues, uh, Lauren here, who is the executive director and Liz, who is on the uh, advisory board of Village Health Works and a really wonderful personal friend, um, and uh, Jimmy as well, colleague. And uh, thank you so much, Brian, for uh, everything and making this happen. Uh, as you, I'm assuming that uh, everyone who is here at least know that there is a country called Burundi. <laughs> but I would like to uh, maybe start with this uh, story uh, about this country that uh, gave me both uh, birth and, uh, and agony, really. Uh, but uh, it's, it's that kind of situation that you just love so much, even when it can be painful. Uh, one, one day I was uh, traveling, coming from Rwanda, not Burundi, and it was before I became an American citizen. And I was with a friend of mine, uh, Paul Farmer, who uh, is always running and rushing and is telling me, hurry up when we got a JFK. And I don't know whether some of you know what green card is. You have, uh, used to be, you have one line, permanent uh, residence, and US citizen, you have another line. And if you have a green card, you are being asked a lot of questions as if you are criminal. And Paul took this line, if you're a citizen, hurry up, we needed to catch the, the bus so we go to the meeting. And I said, well, it's easier for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he knew, of course, but uh, uh, I reached this immigration officer who was searching and, uh, you know, I, um, maybe he was even Googling, <laughs> looking for Burundi. And, uh, and I said, well, and he asked me, are you sure? It's not Burma. <laughs> and I said, well, it was Burundi when I left. <laughs> I really, I, I don't know how much I have learned from that, but at least from that moment, I learned how to behave myself in front of that situation. So yes, there's a country called uh, uh, Burundi. And some of you who have uh, uh, read uh, Strength in What Remains, you know the story. It's a tragic story, unfortunately. And it is a story that, unfortunately, that is illustrating many other stories that we are hearing from uh, across the world, Syria and different places. Um, I, was, uh, I was born and raised in Burundi. Um, really, not wondering myself what I was going to do uh, tomorrow that uh, really frightened by loss of friends of childhood because of totally preventable diseases. Uh, and it was a life uh, that I and many other friends were asking ourselves, are we next, are we next? Uh, one particular example is, uh, you know, my, one of my earliest memories is when I, was in pri I started primary school I went to school, and there were so many school children and parents with the, with the school children getting all the, uh, the admitted school children into a classroom. And the classroom was uh, big enough to fit 50, 60 students, even though there weren't enough benches, and were packed like sardines. By the end of the school year, the classroom was half empty. What happened to the other half? 
some of the school children died from uh, undiagnosed diseases. Maybe lack of vaccination, maybe uh, pneumonia, who knows? And others simply first grade left school to take care of their parents. And others left school to take care of their siblings because their parents died at home. So these were the conditions that we were born and raised in. And you wonder how come that a country like Burundi, how can it really become a country that we all wish to see and live for our children and their children's children without access to health care, without, without parents around to give their children love every child deserves or to have a conversation that is about the future, is about the laughter, is about the world. When you spend most of the time, you are agonizing, you are in tears. So these are the kind of situation. But then those like me who survived all these, it was not just enough to survive. We asked ourselves, if I were given the opportunity, what could I do? How could I, God, could you give me the power to change this situation? And for uh, people like me, this was really the beginning that, uh, uh, of an idea to go into medical school. So I went to medical school, and uh, unfortunately, in, uh, 19, uh, on uh, October 19, 21st of October 1993, the president of Burundi was assassinated. And I was uh, uh, entering my fourth year of medical school, and uh, the, the war started when the president was assassinated and the country started going down to hell. Uh, a lot of people were killed. I barely made it and uh, uh, ran away. Uh, it's a long story, you will read that from uh, Tracy's uh, uh, book. And uh, ended up uh, uh, after several months in uh, New York City. You know, a lot of people talk about, oh, everyone knows the United States. I, of course, had heard of the United States, but I really didn't know what this country was about, what, how powerful it was. I actually thought that Burundi was one of the most powerful, powerful countries on Earth. And uh, you know, this was one of the jokes on me when I realized there was a tiny country uh, in, uh, uh, where those who were lucky enough to go to school were taught that uh, uh, in French, and uh, that is the language uh, for civilization. That's the road. It's not just the most beautiful language, French, but it's the most elegant. It's the only thing that will, um, will turn you into a civilized person. Well, after going through so much, here I am in New York City. I didn't know anyone. I was carrying my tragedies like a luggage, and I am still able to speak this French and hoping that I will be able to communicate with people. Well, no, no French, English. What happened? I said, am I in an, uh, such an uncivilized country? This is what I was taught, that everyone who is civilized speaks French. But uh, no, I had a very hard time finding someone to talk to in French. Anyhow, to cut a long story short, uh, being in the United States and being in New York City was uh, the most uh, painful uh, moment in my life. And you may wonder why. You survive not only this uh, ugly war, but extreme poverty, and you end up in this country. You will think that that was better, you know? But uh, I didn't communicate, I didn't speak English. Yes, I was born and grew up poor, like many people in Burundi. But at least I had friends around, and I, had, I was lucky to have parents who, even when we didn't have anything to eat, said, no, you are not poor because we are here and we love you. And that was enough for us to keep going and doing whatever we're taught to do. But then here you are in this biggest city, I guess, in the world, so overcrowded with people, but you have no friend. You have no one to talk to, and you have so much to share, you are talking to yourself. So it was a, such a grueling, demoralizing 
conditions felt like punishment from hell. So, uh, and that is when I really, you know, my body was quiet, but my mind was not quiet. And regretting everything I used to believe to be true, uh, uh, regretting my own survival and, and all that. But good people, uh, there are really good people in the world. I do believe, and I do believe that there are more than we think there are, because uh, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be in front of you today, and all my programs probably would have been over <laughs> since. But here I am here because of uh, a wonderful uh, couple, Shari and Nancy Wolf and Sharon McKenna, who not only opened their doors and their hearts for me, who didn't speak their language, had really nothing in common with them but our humanity. And I learned the language, and I went to school. Uh, but uh, during that whole time, uh, until I went back to Burundi, just wondering, overwhelmed by so many questions and no answers to any of my questions, how come that people hate so much, hate each other so much, to the point that they kill neighbors. What happens? So it's OK to say, oh, it's about the Hutus or Tutsis, or it's about this race against these, you know, that race, you know, tribes and things like that. But really, these are the consequences or the symptoms of a disease. You have to think about what is the root causes of these problems. And the root causes of the tragedies of a country like Burundi and any poor country really have to do with extreme poverty and the social living conditions in which we were born and raised in. That's all about it. Lack of access to health care when you need it, and the lack of access to the right education based on a critical thinking, not memorization of facts that you don't even know where they come from. So that's really how I came up with the, the problems or understanding the problems uh, uh, the problems that we have been going through. I went at Columbia University into philosophy in search of understanding this thing called human nature. And I got a diploma, or I got out of that was more questions than answers to me. So, uh, you know, went to Boston, made a wonderful friend, uh, Paul Farmer, who was working in Haiti, and we worked together, and I really felt that uh, there were people who were doing great work and who understood uh, my background, uh, which uh, somehow comes with a lot of stigma and the fear, and you internalize so much, you wonder who is going to understand me, or why should I even share this? You know, some of my family members will be devastated when I talk about growing up poor. It's just uh, a lot that people keep to themselves, or pretending that they are who they are, but they are really not who they are. So it's all package, baggage of stuff that uh, you know, somehow make us just be, you know, behave in a way that we are not truly, you know, doesn't represent who we are. Uh, and I finally went back to Burundi after several years. What I saw in Burundi was extreme poverty, hunger, diseases, and despair. Uh, I, you know, it was devastating. I couldn't function. I couldn't go back to Dartmouth Medical School. You know, this is the beautiful country of Burundi. You can see this lake, uh, the second deepest lake in the world. Uh, on, uh, on the other side, that's Congo. This lake holds 18% of world fresh water. You have a great potential. You, it's a lot. But then, you go into a hospital or you go into families, you look into people's faces and you wonder, how can anyone find happiness again in those kind of conditions? So there are two things really you can do. One is to run away and forget about it. The other is, what can I do? And how can I drag all my friends I know into these, then fix the problems? So this is, for example, uh, uh, in one hospital where there's uh, two patients are sharing ivy, one needle, 
moving from one arm to another arm. And think about all the kind of infections if one is HIV positive and the other one is not and is going back home with more problems in the hospital. And uh, uh, this is another hospital where there is not even lack of medical equipment, but even the gloves. They are used and reused on different patients and washed. These are the conditions that we're talking about. And uh, this is another hospital. I took most of these pictures, so far all these pictures, with my own camera, just walking around, smelling and touching and feeling. Uh, it's this hospital is where we transfer our patients, for example, mothers who need C-section. This is an operating room available for more than 400,000 people. You, just for you to get a picture of what it is and why Village Health Works was created. So these are the conditions, and I, for the first time, went to my village, and the goal was to sit down with the community and ask, what can we do together? First, I encountered skepticism and suspicion. We're talking about former enemies, people who knew who killed who, who raped who, who did horror stuff to you know, neighbors. And again, this is how poverty gets into the body and dehumanizes us. But they had, uh, those who were still around had no one else but themselves. So we destroyed ourselves, we did a lot of horror. Now, do we survive or do we let ourselves go? So I mobilized them and finally they said, okay, this idea of building a health care, a health center on our on the community is really beautiful. So it really started helping them light the spark of their own optimism, which had been almost extinguished. Community members donated the land, which is the only commodity they have. Not only that, I was traveling on my student loans, I had no money, uh, so who was going to make bricks? Themselves. They got together and they started talking a lot. They built the, the, the first road that links the, their village to the highway to uh, the, the capital city. And uh, you can see they even managed to rent, uh, to raise some money, 150 US dollars, so that they could rent a truck and put construction materials up to the hill. But they're actually pushing carrying the truck instead of the truck carrying the construction materials. You know, for some reason, almost every truck that doesn't work anywhere else in the world ends up in Burundi. <laughs> and you know, it's like the story of Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill. It's Greek mythology, but in Burundi it's the reality. But what is really beautiful about this is that, you know, when you bring people together, and they, you know, this one was not even that hard because we're talking about what they feel more than anyone else. They're determined to seize the opportunity and bring decency where it had been lost. And that getting together, as they push, they are also talking about what, why they couldn't do this it, you know, from the beginning. Why were they busy hating, running away from each other? And the reconciliation really started in the process of building Village Health Works. And now this community is one of the most peaceful communities I can, I, you know, can imagine. So it was not just the men making bricks and the women carrying bricks, it was also the children who are not going to school. Everyone was involved, carrying all these bricks, taking them to wherever they needed to do, to take them. Uh, again, the community members, meetings after meetings, uh, talking about the vision, which is really, really to build a health care model and uh, uh, to be a beacon for a struggling country and to inspire others to do uh, good. So a year later, we had uh, this little clinic, it could be. Uh, every single brick in every single wall here was made by the community. Uh, so uh, we opened uh, the clinic immediately, uh, and since that time, we never closed our door. We see hundreds and hundreds of patients every single day. They come with a lot of uh, problems, chronic diseases, 
this is the one of uh, uh, before and after of, uh, the patients we see. You look at this child, and so many children in Burundi are suffering from these kind of totally preventable uh, health issues. And how do you really expect a country, again, that today is 50% of the population are children under the age of 15? But in those kind of conditions, where, where is the future of this country? And what is our responsibility, as who are so lucky to be in a place like this, to have the knowledge, the medical knowledge, the technology, the communication, everything available? What for, my friends? What for if all this knowledge is not available to save lives, educate people so that all together we can contribute to changing the world, making the world a place that is really the place we need for our own children and you know, the future. So this is a troubling question. And so whenever you hear these problems, corruption, distractions, human loss, and things like that, don't look for the answer anywhere else. It starts from these kind of conditions. If you suffer this way and you manage to survive it, you really have a tiny window of opportunity. For example, malnutrition. The first two years of life, extremely important. If you make it, and 10 years after, nothing is done about it. Food is medicine. Nutritious food is medicine. 10 years after, mental retardation will follow, and it is irreversible. So think about a country today of Burundi that has 75% of the population are suffering from malnutrition. I think that's right, Lauren. It's the hungriest country on the planet. And yet, it's a country that has nine months of rain a year. It's a place where you can grow anything you want, but it's knowledge that is missing. It's a country of farmers. That is how tragic it is when, to see these kind of uh, uh, problems and yet to, in, in a place where you have really unique opportunities to make a difference and change the situation. Frederick is one of our many patients. She, uh, he was abandoned by his, his wife, his children because they tried everything they could, even relatives, to bring him back to life. And nothing worked. So the family members are saying, well, whatever is killing him, we've been watching him, you know, emaciating, and it, we are all going to die this way if this is something that we are going to breathe, if this is like an airborne disease, or you know, who knows? And the last thing they could do was just run away, leaving him there. We use community health workers. They go into houses. They go into the villages. And she, uh, one of the community uh, health workers came to us, a woman, said, there's someone over there. Can you bring an, an ambulance? So we brought an ambulance. We took him to a village health works. Five months after, that is Frederick. That's the same guy. So we took him back home. The entire neighbors, community of neighbors, ran away from him. And they started calling him a ghost because they thought that he died and they knew that they abandoned him and the ghost was coming to hunt them. I spent three hours trying to explain to his wife, this is your husband. And, and again, you know, when you talk about you know, access to healthcare, to treatment, a lot of people what, was, what, what is he suffering from? HIV. And all the core infections, TB and kind of stuff, malnutrition, everything you can think of. And a lot of people were actually on the same path, you know, dying the same way. And they couldn't even talk about their, you know, HIV or listen to someone about HIV testing or counseling because there was nothing available and there's a lot of stigma behind it. When they saw him, we started being flooded by patients coming for you know, testing. Is there anything I can do? You know, drugs are available. So this is really how you can change a community, you can change even what people call a culture or a mindset. It's, you know, why would I want to know that I'm going to die tomorrow? What is the quality of life? We're talking about all these issues uh, you know, a few minutes ago. 
It depends. It, it really depends. But uh, medicine is available. Good people are available. And they should be available in Burundi. They should be available for everyone who needs that so that uh, can raise family. Who do we see? It's a country of farmers. We have a lot of 75%. Uh, uh, some are students, and uh, you, you can see you can see what you know. We are in a rural area. That's uh, uh, where are they coming from? It's a very interesting. You see uh, these numbers, and we are right there where there's this arrow. Uh, what is happening here? You know, why do we have people? You know, the vast majority of people coming from Gastaba or different places and are walking for hours, and some come from Tanzania and they walk for days. These are places where many uh, repatriated population are, and they have no hope, no other place but village health works. Maternal health is, uh, is uh, extremely disturbing. We are today where the United States of America was 100 years ago. There should be no place on the planet in the 21st century where mothers die in childbirth because of lack of C-section. There should never be any place. We know what to do. And yet we have lost so many, many mothers in childbirth. Just to give you, you know, a story, uh, two years ago, there is a woman, a community health worker at Village Health Works who spent all that time telling other pregnant mothers, go to Village Health Works for prenatal care. And uh, she came in the middle of the night. Uh, the midwife was there trying to help. And we tried what we could. But because we have no operating room today, we can't do C-section, we couldn't do anything to help the mother do C-section at Village Health Works. So it's in the middle of the night, it's pouring rain, torrential rain, we drove to the capital city. The night was so long, it took four hours instead of two hours. We got into this medical center, we waited for a surgeon who was nowhere to be found. Finally, he showed up and then opened the womb. The baby was dead, the mother didn't wake up. Then the next morning, we went off, we bought a coffin for the baby, a coffin for the mother, back into the village. Uh, she left a few children behind. Those children are with one of uh, uh, our community members who is raising her own children. See the consequences of losing a mother. It's not just a life lost. It's a village that is lost. It is demoralizing. And how do you take care of all of these people? It's so demoralizing for our wonderful physicians. And one of them is my wife, trained out of Harvard Medical School and the UCSF, just two days ago was calling me in tears. I just lost a patient. I know what kind of punishment. I know what to do. I was trained for all these years, and I am here to watch people die this way. Burundi has more physicians, Burundians, who are in the Western world than the physicians who are in the country. Why? Not because they hate the country, because there's no physical space. There's no medical equipment. And what we are doing now is to build the first women's hospital that will have a surgical capacity. It's a 120-bed hospital. And our mission really is to become a healthcare model and train the next generation, be a beacon for a struggling country, and inspire others. Show that it's possible from right there. So I don't know whether you have. Uh, 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 yeah, this is uh, this is the hospital that uh, we are. Uh, we just finished uh, designing. Uh, we, interestingly, we start, we, we broke the ground uh, last uh, week of uh, September, and uh, it's, uh, it's going to cost just the construction about $9 million, uh, Lauren. And we, we, we have enough today to start as we keep doing fundraising. 
And this project is not Dale's project or Lauren's project or our community's project. It is a really everyone is a project who cares for human beings, for the planet, for the well-being of uh, humanity. So uh, maybe, uh, and what does it take? It's not just a building. It, 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 takes, it takes space. That's the building, that's the infrastructure. It takes getting medical equipment, it takes getting you know, medicines, and boy, we, you know, it's available. I mean, we're talking about people dying from pre-modern diseases. It's, everything is so available. Systems, communications. You know, my wife is in Burundi nine months a year. <laughs> I am there every other month. You may wonder what kind of marriage is that. It's a calling, it's a passion, it is not easy. And every time I am calling her or she's calling me, hello, can you hear me, can you hear me? Internet doesn't exist. It, it's there, but communication, it's a terrible situation. We have a community health workers. It's so harder to communicate with the healthcare professionals. Where are you? What is it? You know, no reception, no connectivity. No, it's just like a numbie. And these are people who are trying to do everything they can to save lives and to be happy. Uh, so yet, here we are at Google. Here we are in the center, the heart of modern technology but not available to really save life or have a conversation with someone you love so much and who is so far away and who has so many choices to do. So, and again, building a space, a place based on a dignity. It's really who we are and what we are trying to do so that when we come to Burundi, or we bring, uh, you know, like Jamie, you, 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 you are there, you, you should be seeing patients in a comfortable environment, you should be able to find the medical tools where they are the same way you do it from right here. It should not be a commodity, it should be available to everyone. So that's what we are uh, trying to do and um, uh, uh, thank you very much. If you have uh, any questions now and, yeah, yes, 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 yeah, there's a video here uh, that I, I hope can put everything in perspective. You know, thank you very much. first opened it was meant to be a clinic but it quickly became clear that you couldn't in this setting just focus on health it was a revolving door you'd have people come in you'd um, treat them they'd go out and they'd be back again um, and that there was a potential in this space to really do this integrated approach where we're addressing the root causes of illness where we're looking at what are the effects of poverty on your ability to access clean drinking water on your ability to grow nutritious foods? Uh, what are the effects of education and providing a place for both girls and boys uh, to be in school? Also, in a post-conflict setting like this, creating these different ways that people can really come together. And I think that that's about the most powerful part of Village Health Works. When we ask people to come and join their hands to build Village Health Works, most of the people who showed up were women, and most of the people who were working harder than anyone else were women. Why is that? Simply because of how, uh, how marginalized they have been, and empowering them was key. We knew uh, women have suffered more than anyone else um, before and during the war, they are the ones who become pregnant and they become pregnant in a country where health indicators are abysmal uh, and becoming pregnant is almost a death sentence.
the vision moving forward is to continue to expand our health services. The immediate goal is to build a women's health pavilion that will have C-section capability, that will have other ORs to offer general surgery, that will help us move towards our vision of really being a teaching and a training center. Um, it's heartbreaking right now because we have some of the things you need to be a properly functioning hospital, but we don't have C-section capability. We don't have any surgical capability. So we see a woman who comes in, in labor, um, runs into problems, and the best option right now is to send her uh, 45 minutes away, bumpy road, um, difficult journey, and then to try to advocate for her um, to get expedient care. And sometimes that happens, and sometimes it doesn't. What happens when a mother dies? What happens to the children? What happens to those who are staying behind? It is uh, all devastating and it is society's fault. It's us and we turn our ears deaf and our eyes blind and that's not acceptable. Poor people deserve better than poor things. I think that there's this thought that to provide surgical care, you can just throw up a tent and get a visiting team in every now and again. And I think that's wrong. I think we need to approach um, care for people with the same sort of spirit that we would approach care for our loved ones. I think that we need to transition into creating structures that are good structures, um, that are places that promote dignity for patients. That's our hope, to change a country and to change the world. And it is possible, starting from right here. very much for being here today. I read the book and was really in awe of your story. Um, and there's so many incredible pieces of that story, but one that stuck out to me was how involved the community was in, in building the clinic that exists today, um, especially the part about um, you had gone to a road construction company and they had given you a very high price and then instead you had the community build the road and he said uh, he was completely shocked by that. Um, so I was wondering with this new hospital project, if you aim to build it in the same way by getting the community involved in the building um, and sort of what that process is looking like from your standpoint. Yeah, th thank you very much. And please chime in, uh, uh, Lauren. It's, um, we already have already started building it in a way that, uh, for example, without the hydropower plant which we just completed. We couldn't, you know, we would not never be able to operate the hospital. So the community members, and uh, maybe Lauren can tell you the story, but when she went for the first time, do you would like to tell the story? Oh, sure. <laughs> so uh, I, I, thank you. I joined Deo in Kigu 2 in March 2015. And it was when the hydroelectric plant was still just in the planning stages. And we wanted to do the building during the dry season. Oh, okay. Okay, we wanted to do the, the building of the hydroelectric plant during the dry season, which is really the summer months. And so I went with one of the engineers to hike to the site of the hydroelectric plant. And... Um, I, I mean, I, I've hiked, I've climbed Kilimanjaro, I'm a pretty good hiker, and yet I found this hike incredibly treacherous because it was wet, because the, um, there were a lot of just sort of straight down drops with no switchbacks. It was very thick jungle. There was someone, you know, chopping the, some of the foliage with a machete. So it was quite an intense hike to get to this river that was going to be the site of the hydroelectric plant. And when I came back hours and hours later, I said to Deo, like, Deo, there's no way they're going to be able to start construction in a month because there's no way the 
construction equipment will be able to get there. There's no access road. It can't, I mean, I don't think it's possible. And sure enough, um, within six weeks, the community had rallied together and we got some equipment for them and they built this um, road that the construction equipment was able to use to access the river and, um, and the hydroelectric plant has been completed. But one of my favorite stories was that there were some soldiers in the region who were a little bit alarmed to see the community gathering together. And when they asked, you know, what are you, what are you doing? And they were told that the road, that they were building this road in order to build a hydroelectric plant and bring electricity for a hospital that's going to be built. The soldiers put down their guns and they joined and picked up hose and helped out. So, so yes, the community's extraordinarily involved. Um, however, for the construction of a comprehensive district level hospital like this is going to be, we are working with an international building company and they will definitely be hiring a lot of local labor. Um, that's very important to us, but we needed the sophistication of a, um, you know, a strong international building company. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you talked a lot about nutrition and the importance for early childhood health. Can you talk about why there's such an issue, given that it's such a you know, good place potentially for growing, and what you're doing to address early childhood nutrition? Uh, thank you so much. It's um, it's lack of knowledge. Well, we have it's it's really sad and funny in a way because we have a lot of agronomists, but many of those agronomists are looking for offices instead of going into the field and to teach people how to grow nutritious food. In Burundi, everywhere you go, there's there are so many farming fields, but it's what they are growing mostly cassava and it's no nutrients. Working so hard, and mostly women with the babies on their back and, and all that, it's just a lack of knowledge. People really haven't learned what it is to, be, to eat healthy. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, we unfortunately have been a country that suffered a lot. A lot of people who knew how to grow the right food died. And then many, many others were in the refugee camps in the different countries, and they came back not really knowing the skills that their parents and others had. So that's the reason why. And, uh, you know, the soil has uh, been uh, depleted, you know, because of the destruction, burning mountains. You hear about Haiti. Uh, you know, there is a really a risk that a country that used to be so lush with a lot of trees uh, almost on every single hill it has the likelihood of becoming another Haiti if we don't uh, pay close attention and do something about it. So it's just really mostly lack of knowledge. And what we are doing, uh, you know, this uh, woman who was uh, uh, speaking on a uh, uh, um, uh, video is Catherine, my wife. She was in Burundi. She took a year from Harvard Medical School in, uh, in 2008. So she would drive. Uh, she, we didn't even have a vehicle. She would, you know, put herself on the bus and she's off to Rwanda to get plumpy nut from the Clinton Foundation in Rwanda. You know, it would take days. And you are bringing all these boxes of plumpy nuts. Plumpy nuts, like in shore. Yeah. What you have inside is it's peanuts, soybeans, all kind of stuff, nothing in it that we cannot grow right where we are. So then we said, well, why can't we just grow these here? And we started a demonstration garden next to the hospital. Every single patient and a family member would come to Village Health Works. The first thing that you would do, go to the demonstration garden. And then the next thing you do, you are taken to our malnutrition ward, where you have children like the one you just saw before and after. And a lot of community members, they know these children. And they God, what did you give them? Food. Food. And the food we are growing from here, and there's a plumbing us to help them you know, regain their strength to chew, to swallow, and all that. So uh, we started, uh, in addition to that demonstration, creating a demonstration garden, agriculture co-ops. So they are 
a lot of people are really learning in our catchment area how to grow food, how to eat healthy, even a fish pond, all kind of stuff. So this is what we are doing, and a lot of people are coming to learn. But we still need really good agronomists, good people, nutritionists. It's not enough to just grow food, but also to you know, teach people how to cook it and how to eat it. So it's possible, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.